Glad you're here tonight. Let me do this little uh, correction. I want to mention this correction. I had a typo, a mistake on one of the slides from last time. And let me find it here. Well, Diane told me about it after class, but I just wanted to, to, to tell you, if you see that, just tell me during, during class, that word uh, overturned. Some of you might have, might have noticed it. And I can correct it on the fly, maybe, but what I did is um, I fixed that. It's just a minor mistake there, but I also adjusted some things and re-uploaded this file to the Google Drive. So if you want all this stuff, these eight guidelines for interpreting the Gospels, and if you want the passages, there's a lot of text here, a lot of references I'm giving you can have access to that by by going to that site and i'd be glad to give you the link to that if you don't have it well uh we addressed last time we need to if we want to interpret the gospels correctly we, we want to get the most out of these books that god has given to us we want to get all that god has revealed to us in, in the Gospels, we want to get out of them all that God has given us. And these, I think these guidelines will, will help us, all right? And we spent uh, quite a bit of time, we spent some time on this to seek to understand how individual pericopes relate to the purposes of the uh, Gospel as a whole. I'm going to go ahead and just jump to number two because we just hurriedly addressed this. But here we said, look for, examine themes, themes, uh, did I have a mistake there? There. Um, I skipped. I'm sorry. Well, no. Uh, that uh, okay. Good. I'm glad you mentioned that so that there's no confusion. Under number one here, looking at the individual pericopes and interpreting them in light of the themes, the overall themes or theology of that particular gospel. Under that, under that heading, we looked at a couple of things, how that they were written to reveal the identity of Christ, so we need to read them Christologically. Remember we said, uh-oh, uh, whoops, just a moment. See, I even have a spare pencil, Apple, pen, Apple pencil, but uh, I have to sink it here. The, the importance of, this is under that heading, that really all the Gospels need to be read Christologically. That is, there, we need to ask the question, you remember, if you weren't here, as we look at each episode, each block of teaching, each interaction that Jesus had, what is this telling me about who God is as he's revealed himself to us in Christ? So that was the one thing under that heading. Maybe I should have used A there. might have been a little confusifying. And then the number two was, though, it also, we also have the example and teaching of Jesus as a guide for discipleship. Mark is big on emphasizing discipleship. Luke likes to stress the sacrifice required, the, the, what repentance is. <laughs> Would you guys tell me when this is happening? How, how, long, how long were you going to let me go? Uh, watching Bob Ross's hand. What's that? Uh, yeah, speak up if I don't notice you pointing. You were all pointing and I didn't even notice. Did, did, well, when did it go up there? How long has it been up there? So you already saw that, right? Okay, you saw that. All right, so number two. <laughs> Can we start the recording over? Can I just go back? Um, so we, we want to see what it tells us about Jesus. And then number two, we also though want to see how it is revealing to us how we need to be like Jesus. And there are some questions and concerns that have to be addressed under that heading, like what things about Jesus uh, can we imitate and are we supposed to follow, and what things about him are unique, of course, and that I'm, I'm not going to look at Jesus. And that's where that mistake came up, right, where 
Jesus is uh, overturning the, the tables of the money changers, and I don't think I can go in and be violent and, be, and do that sort of thing because Jesus did it, and after all, Jesus is our example, or keep the Sabbath because Jesus kept the Sabbath, and therefore we need to bind Sabbath keeping, and it needs to be part of uh, faithfulness in the church today, that sort of thing. That, that's done with the gospel. Sometimes people fail to understand, make, make those proper distinctions. So th th those are things we discussed under that heading. All right. But then under this one, looking at these, um, ap what we call headings here, what I'm calling introductions or these programmatic statements. All that means is, you know, a passage that, that we think is really a, an important one that's setting up the program, the agenda of that writer and what he's telling us about, about Jesus. So we said at the beginning of Mark, you see that right off, right off the bat in the fact that he just, in, in chapter 1, verse 1, he says, uh, I'm writing to you about the, the gospel, and the gospel is about Jesus, the Christ, the Son of God. So Son of God now. Son of God, that Son of God motif becomes very important in his gospel. It's right there in verse 1, but then in the middle of his gospel, Peter uh, makes confession of the identity of Christ. That's part of that, that opening statement in chapter 1. I'm saying you can view it like a heading here where he's cluing you in on these, these are the uh, characteristics or these aspects of Jesus Christ, are, this is why I'm telling you what I'm telling you in this gospel. So then in the middle of the gospel, you have this declaration uh, about Jesus made, and then again, that refers back to that, and then again, in the climax of the book, in the crucifixion account, that comes in again once more, as Jesus is declared by the centurion to be the Son of God. When we look at Mark's gospel, that will be a powerful moment that we really want to understand in the way Mark develops his story, the impact that that should have in shaping the, the message that Mark is giving us about Jesus. So look, we want to look for these kinds of things as we go through the book. Let's, give me, let's look at another example that I didn't really address. Uh, the heading in Matthew, if you want to call this, he just begins in verse 1 with Jesus' Davidic lineage. And so Matthew is very concerned about showing that Jesus Christ is the son of David who will reign on David's, the king, who will reign on David's throne. And, and Matthew presents Jesus as the fulfillment of the hopes of Israel and that he's the founder of a, of a new Israel. So you have Jesus fulfilling God's purpose for Israel, Jesus being the faithful Israel that Old Testament Israel failed to be. And then beginning a new, in Matthew, we have reference to the church. You don't have that in the other Gospels, where he's going to talk about creating this new community, this new Israel. Now, in the very first verse, when we're told this is the genealogy, the genealogy of Jesus Christ, that, that word, and some will say that term can be translated uh, Genesis, or this is the beginning of a story about this story about Jesus Christ. This idea of Jesus is the new Moses. Jesus is the new Israel. Jesus is bringing a new Israel. This idea, that, that's where you see this note I have here. This, th this is where the importance of having a good translation comes in because there might be some subtleties where these kinds of terms are translated differently depending on what Bible you have. And so I would encourage you to compare translations. And if you use good uh, commentaries, they scholarly commentaries will call attention to some of these things that maybe don't come out in our English translations. So, uh, and I can recommend some to you. In fact, I should do that. I that's a good idea. I think I'll do that with each gospel I'll put in on the screen, in the file that will be uploaded so you can access it. It'll be on the video, some, some really good, up-to-date scholarly commentaries and some maybe critical commentaries that are 
maybe for a little bit higher level and maybe some that are more on the, the common level that maybe would, would appeal to, um, to you if you're not wanting something too technical. All right, so I'll, I'll do that, but that will help you notice some of these things as you look at the text. And that verse in Matthew 19, 8, that where Matthew says, uh, Jesus says, Truly I say to you, in the new world, whoops, in the, in the new world, in the new world or the regeneration uh, is really what that Greek word is there. Jesus is coming to bring something new. He is coming to fulfill what God had, had purposed and, and finally bring this new, usher in this new age at the end of his gospel, right? I will be with you even unto the end of the age. So as you go through Matthew, then you start to see in the placement of material and in the emphasis in Jesus' teaching that is unique to Matthew in places that he is bringing out something here. You don't see that in the same way in Mark or in Luke or in John. Something here that you want to pay attention to and understand as a theme or an emphasis in, in his gospel as you work your way through uh, that that gospel. Now that's uh, that was just under headings, under introductions. You know, Mark, just chapter one, verse one is what we referred to as a heading. This the, the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Brief statement there, but really his introduction. You read, how does Mark want to start the story of Jesus? Casting out demons, showing his authority over these demonic powers and the forces of evil. He shows us here at the very beginning of his gospel, there are several things that become themes then throughout the rest of Mark's gospel, where you have that uh, encounter showing Jesus' authority over demonic forces. Jesus' baptism, he says, is a fulfillment of what Isaiah said, that God himself, that this was God himself coming. He takes a, a text from Isaiah about Yahweh, about God, and he says, this is, uh, this is being fulfilled in Jesus Christ. And he alludes to, he's, uh, there's implications here of the promise of Ezekiel that the new covenant is going to come. And when the new covenant comes, there'll be the descending of the Spirit, and God's presence is going to be through His Spirit. So we see an implication right from the beginning of Mark's gospel. It's not like John, where John just comes right out and says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and just emphatically, explicitly declares His deity. But Still, if you look carefully at it, you still see in the synoptics, and for example, in this opening pericope in John, all the way through verse 13, I would mark that off as a sort of introduction to John's whole gospel, reference to his deity, his sonship, his supremacy, his authority, his fulfillment of prophecy, and, and all of that right there at the opening of his gospel. And now, we're looking for that as we go through the gospel, and the rest will, will be more meaningful. In the prologue of John, you have the, all the major, and in the sermon I did a three-part series on the prologue, we pointed this out, that really it's like an, it's like an overture that with all the major themes that uh, John is going to develop in his gospel, you see them all r right there, and I pointed those out, and I think we mentioned this uh, in, in the last class. So let me go ahead then, and I didn't mean to go back that far. I thought that this, that's where we left off. Now I realize uh, I, I overlap quite a bit, so I apologize for that. But these programmatic statements now, this other point, in other words, here, here are key passages. We did this as we went through the Old Testament text and we'd start a book and I'd give you some of the historical background and then we'd look at the themes and then give key passages. And in Matthew, at the beginning of Matthew's gospel, he declares that here in chapter 1, verses 21 through 23, in his birth narrative, some of the unique things that are only in Matthew's birth narrative. Luke has a birth narrative too, but Matthew's is distinctive and declares this fulfillment 
of the prophecy that God, that a virgin would conceive and that her son would be called Emmanuel, which is God with us. Now think about this. God is going to be with us. Right here, this is a key text in Matthew, right at the beginning, but then go back to the sea. Notice chapter 28, verse 20. At the end of the gospel, at the very end, he says, I will be with you even to the end of the age. So Jesus' presence continues now in his church. And in fact, and then in the middle of the gospel, I should have included this as well, in chapter 18, verses 15 through 18, right there in the middle of the gospel, Jesus says, when, when two or three of you are gathered together, what? What? There am I. I am present. When we introduce Matthew's gospel and we talk about the themes in his gospel, there's an emphasis that God is present in Jesus, and then Jesus is present in his church, and then the presence of Jesus in the church is his presence in the world. It, I will be with you. Take this gospel to, to all the nations, and I'm going to be with you. I'm still going to be present in you as you carry out this mission of taking the gospel to the world. So Matthew is giving us something powerful here about God's presence in Christ, but his continuing presence in this new community, this new Israel that, that he creates. I'm, again, I'm getting excited just thinking about it. I just got goosebumps. I'm sorry. I just get, uh, even if you can't tell, I'm very excited about it. I'm also medicated at, at the moment. So um, my hands were shaking so bad earlier, I couldn't write some of these things. Because I'm on drugs. I'm taking drugs, okay? How, who else in here is medicated right now? Everybody, right? I don't want to, don't judge me. How many rats do we have? <laughs> you addicts. Uh, hey, I need, you to, I need you to meet me afterward in the alley behind the church so I can get to, I, I, I need a fix. I need to get hooked up. No, I, I'm, seriously. So, uh, seriously, really? So here we go with uh, with Luke now with Luke um, here here now it's not necessarily these uh, key texts are not necessarily right at the very opening in Luke there's a really good re, there we have really good grounds to believe it's in chapter four when Jesus is in the synagogue in Nazareth where he grew, Nazareth where he grew up. And he opens the scroll and he reads from the prophet Isaiah, the spirit of the Lord is upon me. Well, Luke has more references to the Holy Spirit and emphasis on the Holy Spirit and the working of Christ and the Holy Spirit given to the church and the miraculous working of the Holy Spirit among Jesus' immediate followers and then the ongoing presence of the Spirit. Well, he says, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me to preach good tidings to the poor. Luke is showing over and over Jesus' concern for the poor, for the outcasts, for the downtrodden, for the marginalized. Emphasis, he puts more emphasis on women than the other Gospels. Why am I rocking back and forth like this while I'm teaching? Somebody tell me when I'm doing that. Um, and, then, and then also, at the end of his Gospel, at the end of his gospel, he's telling us that Jesus is really the meaning of all scripture, that at all, not just prophecies that explicitly point to the Messiah or make reference to the, to the Messiah coming, but the Old Testament story as a whole, that the, all the scriptures, all the law and the prophets and the Psalms, they're all about me. And so Luke gives us uh, good insight there as to how he's trying to show that Jesus is what the entire Bible story is all about. It's, it's so great when you read Luke's gospel in light of, of that powerful conclusion that Jesus makes in a very, in a fascinating way with those two disciples on the road to Emmaus who don't know who he is and then suddenly he, he manifests himself to him as they're breaking bread. Breaking bread's a key theme in Luke. Table fellowship. It's there that the Lord reveals himself in the breaking of the bread. We sing a song like that when we take the Lord's Supper. It's in the breaking of the bread. He's present with us in the breaking of the bread. He makes himself known. He makes himself present. Uh, among us. It, that's a very important theme in Luke as well, that, uh, that we want to view the gospel in, in light of that. I got to stop. We got to move on. Okay. All right. Number, number three, look at repeated themes 
and phrases and theological emphases. I've done this with you as we've gone through the Pentateuch, for example. We did it especially in Deuteronomy. You remember we kept calling attention to how the fear of God and, and, and the love of God is emphasized over and over. I, I call attention to, to those kinds of things in, for example, Ruth and the chesed of the Lord, the loving kindness of, of the Lord. Uh, comes up it, how it comes up in each uh, encounter or each uh, episode. So we we've been doing that as we've been studying together through the Old Testament record. But we're going to do that as we look through the Gospels. So a couple examples once again. Mark uses the word, the term authority, nearly twice as much as say Matthew or John. Now Luke follows him to some extent more than Matthew in this regard, but. Mark clearly has a unique emphasis on Jesus' authority and his authority being present in his teaching. Wow, how many people need to understand that? Uh, they think they respect the lordship of Christ and his authority over them, but they disregard his teaching. Well, Mark emphasizes authority. In John, John, and not only in his gospel, but in his letters, in 1st and 2nd, 3rd John, you see the word know or verbs of knowing come up over and over or some form. Knowledge, know, knowledge. Knowing verbs come up three to four times more in John than in the other Gospels. And for example, Jesus knowing. I've listed some verses here. But look how in the, in the prologue in chapter 1 and verse 10, notice uh, he was in the world, and that's another term that John uses a lot, the world. He was in the world, and the world was made through him. Notice the repetition of terms. This is what we're talking about. But the world did not know him. So he talks about the, the, the world and, and makes it an, like, love not the world, neither the things that are in the world, 1 John 2. But then he says in, in John's gospel, John 3, 16, for God so loved the world. So there's a sense in which John speaks of the world as the object of God's love, but then he uses that term to say we're to be separate from the things of the world. So look, we want to look for how John is using world, the word world in his gospel. But notice this, and uh, the world was made through him and the world did not know, the world did not know him. That doesn't show up very well, does it here? Did not know him. I remember we said uh, a key verse from John. In fact, I'm thinking of putting it on the wall here. John 17, 3. This is eternal life that they may know you. John 17, 3. This is why God made us, to know him and to be known by him. To know him, to be known by him, and to make him known. That's a good way to summarize what the whole, why we're here what life is about to to be known by and to know God and make him known so John says this is eternal life that you may know him the only true God and Jesus Christ whom he sent well the world did not know him but notice Jesus knowing so that idea is introduced notice though as I go back to these passages look at Jesus knowing here like uh, in the first encounter with Nathaniel, and he knows about him. Yes, uh, Jim. Is this the same, the same idea that's in, in um, 1 Corinthians 13, where he talks about we will know as well as being known when we're in heaven? You know what? That's an enigmatic passage there in 1 Corinthians 13, but recently I was reading from N.T. Wright about this, and Paul is the one who says that you, in, in, uh, in Galatians and in Corinthians, he speaks of, uh, that you are known, but rather or that you know, and rather that you are known by God. <laughs> to be known by God is the object of our lives, so to be known by God. And in that verse, I, I just suddenly had an epiphany about that. I was so excited about it, I called, I contacted some of my preacher friends. I said, look, 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 I, I got to have somebody to talk to about this. Uh, I think I, I have a little bit of an understanding now. Maybe that's a hard passage at the end of where he says, well, now we see dimly uh, in, as in a mirror, but then we'll know fully even as we are known, right? Is that the, that's, I'm butchering that <laughs> verse. Kim laughed if you were here Sunday. I kept repeating Luke 1, 
Do you, you remember that? I kept going back over. I could not say that verse. And she was laughing. She said, you just kept backing up. I said it was my OCD. I knew I was quoting it wrong. And I kept trying to start it over and just have it click, come, come out like I've quoted it a thousand times. And I couldn't do it. And I kept doing it. I started over, did it again, did it again. So for comedy, one day before class, I'll show that clip. I pulled that clip out. And I'm not getting this passage right, so it's bothering me. Somebody read it. At the end of 1 Corinthians 13 and verse... Uh, it being in verse 10, right? 10 and 11. Am I getting that right? So, yes, I think that this is the idea. However, see, now that's going out into the epistles. Not only are we going out of the Gospels, but then we're going to Paul. And then that, that also is a great study to compare Pauline theology, that is Paul's special emphases, and then look at John in light of John. Or look at it in light of what, uh, what, what we have, for example, in, in Matthew about the law. See, sometimes there's a tension. It seems to be a tension between what Jesus is saying in Matthew about the law and what Paul says about the law. We want to work that out. See, that, well, that's, how can we do that if we don't first read the Gospels and get the right understanding from Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John? So then we can go to the epistles, right? We get the uh, kerygma, and then we go to the didache. We, we get the gospel, we get the, the message, and then we go to the exposition of it in the epistles. Well, though, you know, that's how you can really look at Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. The evangelists, the gospels are telling us the basic message of, uh, of Christianity, that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, crucified as a substitutionary atonement for our sins, raised from the dead, and ascended to heaven. And then the epistles t tell us the meaning of that and the application of that in our lives and in the church. Well, how are we going to get all that from the epistles if we don't get the, get the gospel? You see what I'm saying? I keep repeating myself, so... Someone hit me with a riddle and dart. I'm a little bit ramped up. So that verse, though, would be a good one to then look, view in light of this, where he's speaking of how we'll be known and we'll, we'll know even as we are known. It's, uh, I, I don't think I ever really came close to understanding Perhaps. what Paul was getting about there until recently reading it in, kind of in light of some of this. Well, just so we get it right, would you read that uh, nice and loud? Oh, you're not there. Who's there? Who's there? Where do you want me to start? Start right there. Verse. For we know in part and we prophesy in part. But when that which is perfect has come, then that which is in part will be done away. When I was a child, I spoke as a child. I understood as a child. I thought as a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. For now we see in a mirror That's it. dimly. But then face to face, now I know in part, but then I shall know just as I also am known. Yeah, I think I can't get into an exposition of that right now, but I do think you're on to something here. And I think in the church, we've tended to just sort of use that verse to explain our position on miracles, cessationism, and the end, end of miracles. I think there's much, much more to what Paul is talking about in that verse there. And because of that, I didn't really, I didn't really understand it I th as well as I th think I understand it now. But I'm still wrestling with that verse. If anybody else has some insight on that passage, I'd love to, you to share it. But then in, in, in chapter 1, John knows all about Nathaniel. And that, that causes him to say, this is the, this is the Messiah. We found him of whom Moses in the law spoke. We found the Messiah because he knew Jesus had this knowing, this understanding of him. In chapter 2, even though people believed on him at the wedding feast in Galilee when he did his first miracle and turned the water into wine, he did not give himself to them because he knew what was in them. He had this divine insight. In chapter 4, he knows all about the woman at the well. And she says, come tell me a man who to told me all that I ever did. And then that leads to her and to that community, that Samaritan community, coming to recognize him 
as the Messiah. In chapter 16 and verse 30, the, the disciples just say to Jesus, you know all things. In chapter 21, 17, Peter says that to Jesus. Lord, you know all things. So there's this idea of knowing, but see, it's introduced at the beginning of the gospel. And if we're paying attention to that, and if we're, as we go through the gospel, we're picking up on the repetition of that. We're seeing, oh, John is wanting me to see one of the ways he's wanting me to see what he's trying to convince me of and strengthen my faith in is that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, chapter 20, verses 30 and 31, so that I can have life in his name. One of the ways he's trying to convince me of that is his omniscience, that Jesus knows me, that Jesus knows what's in man, that Jesus has the supernatural knowledge. Well, there's a lot of other repeated t terms in John like, uh, like truth and John taught light and life, all those other things we pointed out from, from the prologue. All right, let's move on. Number four, sweet mercy. Uh, examine editorial comments that interpret, oh, I love this in John. Editorial comments, they're rare in the Gospels. They're rare where, the, where you'll have a pause in the account and then the writer will say, now Jesus did this because of Matthew does that at intervals, at set intervals. He really structures his gospel and inserts statements like that, like fulfillment formulas. And we'll notice some of those in Matthew's gospel. But where, for well, let me give you an example. These editorial comments that give you the, significant, in, the significance. In John 2, where we're told he did, this was the first of his miracles that he did. And we're told there, it was there. Did I get this passage up here? I thought I did here. Yes, in 1 John 2, look at the text with me, either in your Bible or up here on the screen. This was the first, this was the uh, first of his signs that Jesus did in Cana of Galilee, and he manifested his glory. Well, that's what he says in the prologue, that um, we beheld his glory. Glory is of the only begotten from the Father in John 1, 14 through 18. So he's telling us Jesus is revealing God's glory. And the miracles Jesus did were manifestations of the glory of God designed to bring people to belief. And the, the disciples believed on him. All right. So there John's pausing to tell you that's what that miracle is about. That's why Jesus did that miracle. Now, again, that doesn't happen throughout the, the, the record. So we want to pay attention when something like that happens. Now, here's what beautiful one, and it's a lengthy one, in chapter 13. Now, he could just tell us that Jesus and the disciples met in the upper room, and Jesus washed the disciples' feet, and this is what happened. But, but, see, John has more of these than the other Gospels. He tells us first, he wants this to have an impact, a certain impact on us. Now, think about how much more meaningful Jesus washing the disciples' feet is when you really let this editorial introduction to it sink in. Chapter 13, 1 through 3. Now, now before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew uh, his hour is a common, it, that's a common recurrence in, uh, in Matthew, the idea of the hour coming. But here's the knowing. He knew his hour had come to depart out of this world to the Father. Now here it is. Having loved his own who were in the world, and he loved them to the end. I'm going to tell you, I'm, I'm about to show you, he loved them, and he loved them right to the uttermost, right even through what, what's about to happen to him as he takes us to the passion. And so during supper, how's he going to show that? During supper, when the devil had already put it in the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him, there's treachery at the table. But Jesus, knowing that the Father, here it is. What? Are you seeing it? Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands, and that he had come from God, another theme in John, and that he was going back to God, he wrote, all right, all of that. And then here's what he did. He wrote from the supper and he laid aside his garment and he took a towel and he tied it around his waist and he poured the water notice all the details it's like he it's it, he's taking you by the hand and he's telling you this first jesus loved his own to the end he knew what was about to happen to him and he knew he was about to leave and go back to god so look what he did and he takes you by the hand and and, and then you're watching it happen in front of you 
that editorial comment is is a uh, powerful indicator of the way that God wants us to understand what is happening in the text. Let me move through these others. Note the responses of the original witnesses to an event. This is number five of the eight principles I'm giving you here. When, when you have uh, Jesus acting and then you see the responses, uh, oftentimes the initial response you see is what the response that we're supposed to have, that the writer, that the particular gospel writer is showing us that Jesus ought to elicit in us. Now, there are exceptions to that. The Pharisees uh, do, not, do not act properly. Uh, the initial response to Jesus' miracle in Mark 3.22, sometimes the reaction will mix uh, good insight with error, like in, in, when he, in Mark chapter 2, when he forgives the man's sins. They say, well, who can forgive sins but one? God, that's correct. But then they say, this man blasphemes. Well, that was incorrect because then he heals the man. So sometimes there's a mixed response. So, how, well, how do you know the difference? We've got to look at the, uh, obviously, we've got to be careful and look at the, the context and then look at the overall characterization that that writer is giving of like the crowds or of the disciples. And then that helps us understand because sometimes, here we go, uh, as I just mentioned, sometimes the reaction of the crowds is obviously what we're supposed to feel when we read the text. They were amazed. Mark likes to show us how astonished and amazed everyone was at what Jesus did. They glorified God. Uh, when they saw it, they believed on him. That's what John wants you to do when you see it. Um, but with the crowds, though, again, we have sometimes the crowd, of course, the crowd calls for his crucifixion, right? And so when, the, when there's a negative reaction from the crowd, though, typically, let me see if I can zoom in on this. When there's a negative reaction from the crowd, typically it's due be, to some kind of manipulation by uh, bad characters like the Pharisees, the, like the religious leaders. So that also, there's a lesson in that too, right? Um, the disciples often are a good model of how to respond, but it will depend. You know, sometimes Jesus rebukes them, so we, we need to see how, how Jesus reacts to their response. But other times we see, obviously, that's the, that's the response that we ought to have as well. So instead of the writer just coming out and saying, see that Jesus did this, this should amaze you. He'll tell you how others were amazed. Or see how, the, see how the disciples responded. They don't come out and explicitly tell you that. And I, I wanted to look at, first, Jesus rebukes them. So they, in Mark chapter 4, after he stills the tempest. So obviously they didn't have the right response when they were fearful when Jesus was with them. But then when they say, who is this that even the wind and the sea obey him? Oh, well, obviously that's the question we're, we're supposed to ask and wrestle with. So that, that's given to us by the reaction to Jesus. So we want to pay careful attention to those sorts of things. Look for connections between when you have narrative, you have teaching, um, or discourse material rather, and then you have some narrative of an event, and a lot of times you'll see a, that the teaching isn't just some isolated reference to something Jesus said on one occasion, but that it explains the event that was in the narrative. And you see that especially in John, where the miracle will be the occasion of a sermon from Jesus. So there's a connection. A cl it's, it's easier to see in John where, for example, when he feeds the multitude with the loaves and the fishes, and then he talks about how he's the bread that has come down from heaven. Or when he heals the blind man in John 9, well, in that context in chapter 8, verse 12, he talked about being the light of the world. And then he goes on, there's this interesting conflict between the Jewish leaders and the blind man, and then Jesus, where they finally end up asking the question, are, are you saying we're blind too? And Jesus uses that miracle. See, that miracle becomes the occasion for that metaphor where Jesus actually talks about the condition of our hearts and whether or not we'll be able to see and respond to him. Two left and we have two minutes. All right, well, that's great. Two and a half minutes. So 
Uh, look carefully. Obviously, we're going to do this as we go through the Gospels. Examine all the Old Testament quotations and allusions very carefully. Now, let me get this example in so we can finish this material. But in Matthew 2, when Jesus fled to Egypt because uh, Herod was seeking to kill him, then Joseph receives a dream from God, tells him it's safe to go back for those who sought the child's life are dead. Are gone. All right, the threat's no longer there. So he's told to return. Well, the same thing was told to Moses in Exodus 4 and verse 19. And Matthew's citation of that, we, we can't see that. It's not a... It's not a quotation where he says, now this came to pass that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the Lord. And then he, it's not, it's not introduced with that kind of formula, but it's just verbatim identical in the Greek translation of the Old Testament, what God said to Moses along that line. Well, remember we said there's a theme where Jesus is the new Moses, and you see it not, not just there, whoops, you see it not, not just there, but then later when, when on the mountain of transfiguration, when God's voice comes out of heaven and says, this is, this is my son in whom my beloved son, listen to him. That was what was stated to, uh, uh, about Moses in Deuteronomy 18 and verse 15, that the Lord your God is going to raise up a prophet uh, among you and you shall listen to him. And that language, Matthew's bringing that language in again. He, well, he's, he's being careful to show us that that is the language God uses about Jesus. So you can see why this isn't just a quotation from the Old Testament. Matthew's going to use a lot of typology and a lot of echoes from the Old Testament, a lot of allusions to Old Testament events and context. And so you see how important it is to understand and know our Old Testament to be able to uh, pick up on some of these things. For example, as Matthew's emphasis of Jesus as the new Moses. Okay, we got the last one in. The bell rang. If you need to go, go ahead. I'm just going <laughs> to I'm just going to get this on the video. Look at the significance of events against the background. Let me just get this next slide in. Don't if you could just stay against the background of Old Testament teaching. See, Jim, if Jim hadn't got me off on 1 Corinthians 13, I'm blaming Jim. Uh, the background of Old Testament teaching and first century Jewish theology. Let me just give you this example. When Jesus walks on the water, when he crosses the sea and he's walking on the water in Mark, when you look at some of the language used there, it's the same as, as we have in the Old Testament, these Old Testament uh, descriptions of the Lord that we have in the Psalms and in the poetic literature, also in uh, Job. It's an identification of the Lord with, of Jesus Christ with Yahweh, the Lord God. Or when he heals the leper, that would bring to mind these Old Testament things, that Moses was healed of his leprosy by God. Or that was a sign, rather, that God gave him. And God afflicted Miriam uh, with leprosy. He healed Naaman with leprosy. And in that account, in that account, uh, the king of Israel says in verse 7, well, well, am I God that I can heal a man's leprosy? Well, what does Jesus do in that account? He heals a man's leprosy. We're seeing all this language and all these allusions that point to not explicit statements saying, hello, reader, I want you to see in this account that Jesus is God. He's, they're doing it by, if you're paying attention to the Old Testament background, and especially the, the, the way the Jews understood the Torah and their law in the first century when Jesus was there. We're gonna, we, we need to pay attention to these things as we go through the gospel records. And those principles will help us understand the gospel, the, those eight principles. You know what we are ready to do? Thank you for your patience through all of these 14 classes and now... We're continuing introduction to the Gospels, but we're actually going to do, we're going to pull up the Gospel of Matthew, and I'm going to do that with Matthew, Luke, and John, and then Mark. We'll give an overview of those Gospels. So thank you for bearing with me through all of this material. It's the first time I've ever taught this. And um, so this is the rough draft. Maybe, maybe I can do it again and do it better and do it.
well. Thank you, though. Uh, I've really enjoyed our, our study so far.